Philip Lowe, the Governor of the Reserve Bank, was going to the Senate committees and saying, we need wages growing at around 4%. We're not even, we're at 3.3% and apparently we need to be worried about wages. It's like, well, actually, we still should be trying to get wages to 4% before we even start worrying about, hey, let's keep a lid on things. One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. Don't the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and we all know that so many Australians are doing it tough at the moment, with the cost of living soaring, real wages falling at record pace, and the RBA's nine back-to-back interest rate rises only making things harder, all in the name, of course, of reducing inflation. Some commentators have been warning the Reserve Bank of a wage price spiral. But what really is driving inflation? Millions of Australians have been stung with a ninth consecutive interest rate hike. The Reserve Bank started raising rates back in May because of surging inflation. Inflation running at around 7.8%. The concern here is, are we seeing a wage price spiral? We um, don't want to see that. We definitely don't want to see that. And I think so time- We hear the Reserve Bank Governor talk about the worries he has about a price wage spiral, that wages are potentially going to put upward pressure on inflation. We're just not seeing that. Wage price spiral that they've been banging on about a few months ago, again, something that Dr Lowe's pulled out of one of his uh, obscure textbooks that doesn't seem to apply in the real world. <laughs> While inflation is rocketing, Australian wages are barely moving. But pay packets still aren't keeping up with inflation. Profits uh, are up for companies and uh, the ACTU arguing that's um, causing the inflation we're seeing. The whole wage price spiral thing was always a fantasy from the 1970s. Instead, what we're seeing actually is a greed price spiral. That's what's happening. This inflation has been driven um, not just by overseas supply issues, it's been driven by excess profits. Recent research from the Centre for Future Work looks at the real drivers of inflation, and you might be surprised by the results. So today I'm joined by the Centre for Future Work's Policy Director, Greg Jericho, to unpack the report. G'day, Greg. Hi, Ebony. Greg, we are we in the middle of a wage price spiral? Uh, alas, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in a spiral of talk about wage spirals. Uh, there's certainly been no end of that and, and no end of warnings that uh, we might be about to enter a wage price spiral, but actual evidence that we're in a wage price spiral is sadly lacking, um, very much not. And and I think everyone knows that's kind of the case when you've got, um, you know, wages growing um, at around 3.3% and inflation is at 7.8%, it's a bit hard to say it's a wage price spiral when wages are so far behind prices. Yeah. So tell us about this report from the Centre for Future Work. What really is driving inflation? Well, what uh, our colleague Jim Stanford did was have a look at the GDP figures because the GDP figures show the entire economy, show what's really driving, what's really growing the economy. And you can pretty much split it up into three things. You can split it up into profits, wages, and the rest is all government sort of stuff. And what he found was that the real driver of inflation is not wages, not labour costs, but profits. And he did this by working out how much more income companies were getting over and above what you would expect. Um, And he found that essentially... They were getting about $160 billion more than you would expect them to get. So tell us about that. What do you mean more than you would expect them to get? What's actually happening here? Well, we know that prices of of, uh, imports and prices of goods that Australian companies use to make things has gone up. You know, we we all know that over the past year or so, price of oil has gone up and gas um, and even things like wheat have gone up. So it's not surprising that the prices of things that need those inputs has gone up. But what we've also seen and we can see through these figures, is that companies have increased prices by more than they need to to cover those increased costs. 
but at the same time, wages have not been going up by anywhere near amount. So in a sense, they're charging more um, for things that they're selling to us, but they're paying not much more or nothing more for the people who are producing all those goods. And that gap essentially is the excess profits that we've been able to calculate. Okay, so if corporations hadn't made these excess profits, what would have happened to inflation? It would be a lot lower, a lot lower. Well, at the moment, you know, inflation is going 7.8%. If we sort of average over the past few years, we're looking at about 5.2%. What um, we found is if the companies had not had all of these excess profits, we would have been looking at an average of around 2.7% inflation, which is right within the RBA's target ban. Now, that's kind of a, a real basement level sort of uh, condition. That's sort of if we took away any sort of sense of, of um, profits above what you would expect given um, normal inflation and normal growth. Now, if we're, we're kind and we, you know, here at the Australia Institute, we do actually like companies to make profits, if only so that we can tax them. <laughs> <laughs> but if we were to suggest that, okay, we, we not only do we want wages to grow faster than inflation, we don't mind if profits grow faster than inflation. So if we give them a bit of a leeway, allow them to have that, I guess, real profit growth marginally above um, the RBA's target for inflation and also taking into account what we'd expect with economic growth, we'd still just be looking at around 3.3% inflation growth, which is just a touch above the Reserve Bank's 3% target ceiling, but certainly not a level where you're going to have the Reserve Bank thing of crops. We've got to do nine interest rate rises in a row. Okay, so basically without these excess profits, the RBA wouldn't have to be working so hard and increasing interest rates as rapidly or as consistently as it had because essentially it would be pretty close to their inflation target. Yep. Yep. I mean, we we still would have seen uh, the Reserve Bank raise interest rates a little bit. Um, certainly, they, they were eager to get get uh, off the 0.1% cash rate, which was, you know, real, basically zero and real emergency levels. And we know that actually wasn't good for the economy. We saw house prices just go mad. Yeah, and so, we're not in the emergency <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no. And so, certainly, they would have risen it, if only just to get back closer to normal. But you know the the nine consecutive raises that's that's unprecedented that's that's even sort of back taking us back to where we were just before the 1990s recession it's really been a massive sort of slamming on the brakes and if we didn't have uh, these excess profits inflation would have been a little bit above and they would have you know they would have been tapping the brakes rather than slamming on the brakes yeah right I couldn't believe it when I woke up today and I saw the Australian Institute Centre for Future Work had done this study and came up with the fact the main driver for inflation in Australia were excess corporate profits, not wages. But new research from the Australia Institute has found its corporations fixated on growing their profits that are driving prices higher now. 69% of the growth in prices above the RBA's target is due to unusually high corporate profits. Research from the Australia Institute shows roughly 70% of the markup in prices for the things we buy relates to business price gouging. Businesses' relentless pursuit of higher profits is making life especially tough for Australians wrestling with higher rent and mortgage repayments. So when the RBA considers inflation and considers increasing interest rates, have they mentioned these excessive profits at all in their considerations? You might be surprised to find <laughs> that no, they they they're not really considering them all that much. Um, if you look at the the most recent statement of monetary policy, which is what the Reserve Bank puts out every three months, a big sort of document that looks at the entire economy and their their reasoning for what they're doing. They mentioned wages seventy five times. They mentioned profits once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sure, you know, when there was a, uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank had to appear before the, the Senate Economics Committee and the House Economics Committee, he did 
sort of acknowledge that no, there is no wage price spiral at the moment. But, 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 if we did have a wage price spiral, it would be very bad. So we have to continue to be very worried about that. So a hypothetical problem gets 75 mentions and the actual <laughs> problem once. Yes, and and it's even more concerning when you consider that actual wage price growth, uh, the most recent figures that, that came out last week, we're pretty much we're a bit below actually what the Reserve Bank was anticipating. They were expecting by the end of last year wage growth of three point five percent and they came in at three point three percent. So wages aren't even growing as fast as the Reserve Bank was expecting them to, and yet they're still very much the priority. They're still very much the thing that they are worried about um, growing too fast and and it would be nice for them to actually have to worry about wages growing too fast. I've been waiting for the Reserve <laughs> Bank to really have to worry about wages growing too fast for about 15 years now. Yeah. Um, Still in no danger. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, I mean, even, um, even the Reserve Bank, with its fairly optimistic figures of wages growth and its hopefully correct figures on inflation slowing, is still not seeing wages growing faster than inflation until the start of next year. So... Mm. Yeah, you know, it's it just I'm I guess a little bit frustrated, a little bit tired, and just a little bit sick of hearing about you know we need to worry about wages growing too fast. And perhaps uh, we should be worrying more about actually getting wages growing a bit faster. Yeah, the problem is though, I mean, yeah. you might get that pay rise, but yeah. that goes nowhere near keeping up with the increase <laughs> in the cost of living. So I did some analysis on the average salary. You are still short. This is looking at gross annual income here. So you've got inflation sitting at 7.3%. We know that's forecast to go up by 8% at the end of the year because of energy prices and food. Wages, yes, we got those numbers yesterday, 3.1. So where are real wages going? Backwards. Backwards by over $3,000. It's tough at the moment. And that's the average. It's get yeah, we're talking, yeah, absolutely. So, UK, so this research uh, has caused a bit of backlash. There was probably, dare I say it, a couple of people or companies from... Uh, from the corporate sector who kind of pushed back against this idea. What were their concerns, Greg? Well, um, weirdly, in a week uh, that uh, saw Qantas uh, announcing a $1.4 billion profit and Coles and Woolworths uh, recording massive profits, there was a bit of pushback from companies and business groups about us complaining about profits. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, the, without getting too in the weeds, a lot of the... Uh, um, Criticism has been either some sort of vague economic things of, oh, we can't really determine exactly how much of an impact uh, profits in the GDP figures are having on inflation, yet they have no problems when we talk about labour costs and the impact on inflation. <laughs> that seems to be a, a very easy thing to do. And also a bizarre sense of uh, the Australian industry group was sort of suggesting that, oh, look, these profits are all going off overseas anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much, um, which... Uh, is that because they're driven primarily from the resources sector? Yeah, I mean, there certainly was that criticism that uh, all, all these profits are coming from, from mining, which certainly mining has been just booming um, at the moment because they're just digging up a lot of stuff and sending it off overseas and not having to pay as much labour as they did certainly during the mining boom. But it's not just the mining industry we're seeing in manufacturing, construction, wholesale trade, retail trade. Um, a whole range of industries where profits are, are growing well in advance of their wages bill. And it really, it's this weird sort of um, thing we see with business groups and, and perhaps more conservative uh, sides of the media of whenever mining profits are, are the ones that are driving things like inflation, we, we hear them saying, oh, we, we shouldn't count <laughs> count mining uh Profits, which always strikes me as rather odd that we're seeking to exclude by far the most profitable sector of our economy and the sector of the economy which um, we were told saved us from the GFC and which has powered our economic growth low these 25 years and everything. But, and but suddenly just it's ignore like, that. Let's, let's just not count them. They're, they're not important. It all goes overseas they're, anyway. They're so. being way too successful. So if we yeah. just ignore them over there, if we just yeah. put them in a little box over here and ignore that then yeah. the problem looks much better, Greg. I ignore the successful <laughs> part, just focus, you know, and, and certainly, you know, and this is one of the things they, they don't sort of uh, admit when we exclude uh, mining, that puts a lot more emphasis on 
areas that have struggled, such as, uh, and which we, we certainly don't doubt, you know, areas like hospitality really took a hit during the pandemic. But also when you talk about the non-mining sector of the economy, it puts a bigger emphasis on education and healthcare, which have seen their labour grow and so wages overall growing, but they're not-for-profit sectors of the economy. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a bit... Um, inaccurate and a bit false to compare wages in the non-mining sector with profits in the non-mining sector because a big chunk of the non-mining sector is a not-for-profit sector so you know it's as soon as you start excluding parts of the economy and and adding in things you start getting biases what our research did was uh, let's look at australia's economy we know our economy is at the moment riding on the back of mining so we should include that. Let's look at what the figures say. These are the figures. We're, no one is no one is arguing that our figures are wrong or that maths is dodgy or anything. They're just saying, oh, you shouldn't count these. And it's like, why? Well, because they're too successful or that's too big or that's abnormal. We're going, yeah, it is abnormal. <laughs> that's <laughs> the whole a, point. <laughs> how about a windfall profits tax exactly. to claw some of that exactly. back? Exactly. Yesterday's Qantas half-yearly profit result, a record half-yearly profit result of more than a billion dollars, and they're not alone. As corporate reporting season continues, oil and gas giant Woodside has announced a record profit of 6.5 billion US dollars. Analysts say double-digit jumps in the big two supermarkets' profits are unprecedented. The corporate profits were up 10.6% in the December quarter. Now, that's above inflation, and it's, you know... Real wages are going down, as we know. A number of people on the crossbench have said we should have already had a super profits tax in place, a windfall for profits tax, to be able to help households with their with their bills, which are off the back of you know, the war in Ukraine. A lot of people think that resources companies deserve to be taxed more. So I think there is this debate at a big level about uh, what's happening with wages compared to profits in the economy right now. Just coming back to the RBA, because I guess, as we talked about in the intro, people are really struggling. There is a cost of living problem, as you've outlined. Wages aren't growing as fast as we need them to for people to keep up. Uh, When the RBA raises interest rates, how is it aiming to get inflation down? Those nine interest rates, what do they do Mm. to the economy? They very much slow the economy because they... They raise the cost of borrowing, so people are less likely to take out loans. Um, And we know investment, whether it's people buying a house or building a house or even businesses taking out a a business loan, that drives economic growth. What it also does is slow consumption because people who are paying off a loan now have to pay off more. And so that reduces the amount of money they can spend elsewhere because you can't you know, just say, oh, well, I won't bother paying my mortgage this month in the same way that you could say, well, I won't go to the movies or I won't go out for dinner this month. Yeah. Um, and so it has a very strong dampening effect on, on the economy. It is designed to slow it. And it works very well when you have a situation like we had during the mining boom years where mining profits were going mad and household income was going mad. Everyone felt flush with cash, not the least because we were getting big tax cuts we didn't really need back then. Um, and the Reserve Bank was kind of right to, to raise interest rates to try and cool everything down. The problem is at the moment we're seeing massive profits, but real wages are falling and it's a case of the Reserve Bank is trying to cool down households that are already getting cooled down by virtue of the fact that they can't buy as much with the money that they have. And it's it's a very dangerous uh, situation so, that could tip over into a recession should they keep hammering um, a household sector that really is is already struggling. Yeah, so they're trying to chill the household sector spending when it's already pretty chilly in there and not really doing much to address the corporate profits, which is where the fire is. Yeah, and you know, we're one of the, the things that we, we would most like to see is just a a bit of a change at the very least in rhetoric, if not actually a pause on, on the interest rate rises, which we certainly would recommend. But one of the things that is underappreciated is how much of an impact the Reserve Bank's talk and words have on on business negotiations, especially in the public sector. When the Reserve Bank is saying, oh, we've got to be worried about a wage price borrow, we don't want wages to take up, 
governments around the country very much listen to that because they don't want to be seen to be contradicting the Reserve Bank and also it gives them an out in negotiations. And we've seen it has had a massive dampening effect on on wages in the public sector. In the last year, public sector wages grew just 2.5%. I mean, 2.5% is terrible even when inflation is growing at its normal rate. But when inflation is growing at 7.8%, that's a horrendous fall in, in real incomes. And it comes from governments wanting to keep wages down because they're hearing the Reserve Bank saying this is a big key and so they're not lifting um, public sector wage caps and and things like that. And it, if we instead had the Reserve Bank saying actually we, we could do with a bit more wage growth, which we actually could because we're at a level of... And apparently the yeah. companies can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what what is forgotten is before the pandemic, Philip Lowe, the Governor of Reserve Bank, was going to the Senate committees and saying, we need wages growing at around 4%. We're not even, we're at 3.3% and apparently we need to be worried about wages. It's like, well, actually, we still should be trying to get wages to 4% before we even start worrying about, hey, let's keep a lid on things. And so we really would like the Reserve Bank to point out these things about profits so that when someone like Alan Joyce um, steps up to a press conference announcing a $1.4 billion profit, there might be some people in the audience who actually ask him about, hey, the the Reserve Bank is suggesting that profits are helping fuel inflation. Uh, is Qantas being at least a good corporate citizen? We want there to be some, I guess, cost for companies being able to make these excessive profits. At the moment, the spin is all, oh, if they're making good profits, that's good for the economy, things are going well and all that, rather than actually that's not a really good look if you you seem to be taking advantage of an inflationary period to make profits. Yeah. Jim Stanford worries the higher mortgage and rent payments that inevitably follow are putting millions of households under enormous financial strain without solving the root cause of the problem. Their rate increases are likely to cause a significant slowdown in the economy, quite possibly a recession later this year. That would be a cure that's worse than the disease. Anything else you'd like to add for the RBA, Greg? <laughs> Stop raising interest rates. Nine in a <laughs> row, it's enough. Give us a, a break. I mean, it, it strikes me as weird that we've had weak wages growth or below expectations wages growth. Unemployment's not being strong in the past couple of months. Start, seems to be rising. Surely after nine in a row, now would be a good time to just have a pause. Let's see what happens over the next couple of months. If if it seems the prices are rising, it's not like we're suddenly going to have a big hyperinflation blowout. Mm. If things are still need to be done, then raise them again. But you know, let's let's have a break, look around, see what's observing, because maybe take know, a look at pro- corporate profits. Yeah, because you month. can you can <laughs> always raise interest rates again, but it is a lot trickier once if the economy starts going downhill to then oh we'll cut rates and try and get it going. It, we we've all, we know from history that the interest rates rising has a lot sharper effect on slowing the economy than interest rates being cut does have on getting it going again. So mm. I think the Reserve Bank should be very wary of going too hard um, and by too much. That's all we've got time for. Thanks, Greg. What a cheery conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. It was great to chat. This episode was recorded live on Tuesday the 28th of February 2023 and things may have changed since recording. You can visit australianinstitute.org.au or futurework.org.au for all our latest research and content, including this research on runaway corporate profits. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Greg Jericho is at Grog's Gamut. And we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Our producer, Jennifer Macy, is at Jennifer Macy with additional editing by Emily Perkins. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening. 